Um, my name is Greta Hansen Maurer. I'm president of the Buell Historical Society, and um, and uh, and I thought before we get started, I've got some announcements to make, um, and then we'll get started with Jim. Um, first of all, I want to say thanks to Jack Ferguson. And first of all, let's step back. Cork Youthier helped oh. move the entire ship by himself. Uh, all the contents of it, and then he hired, and then he hired the um, uh, the crane guy. Yesterday, the crane guy came and took it over power lines, past a propane tank, and set it down like it was nothing. And so now it's moved over to the host, and we can uh, start putting. We have so much to store in there, so we're so happy to have it um, on at the host. And then Vicki Scott <coughs> continues to maintain the outside of the host. We're so appreciative of the of the love and care that she gives to it, because it always looks good down there. Um, I wanted to remind people that on Sunday, October 3rd, from 2 to 3.30, is Carol Wright's 95th birthday party at the host. So it's an open house. There's going to be cake and punch. Um, stop in. She's a charter member of the Beulah Historical Society, and uh, it would be a wonderful way to celebrate her. She's such a gift to our community. Um, we submitted a grant to the Rawlings Foundation um, in hopes for optimizing the outside area of the host, some cement work, um, maybe even some signage, uh, finalize some electricity. So we'll let you know how we came out with that. Um, also, Maureen DeJong is heading up a committee to place three historic benches that we um, got for free. Um, Linda, what's the name of the place it's coming from? The Episcopal Church in the Broadmoor. In so, and they were getting rid of these incredible 16-foot round sandstone benches, and we not only got one, we got three. So we're putting together a committee that will help figure out where are the best places to put them, whether it's the host, whether it's the cemetery, um, the cabin. Mm -hmm. and some, the best place in Beulah is a, is a way um, for people to gather. And the fact that they are all the same is just a really neat um, neat thing. It will add some continuity around the community. Um, I wanted to say thanks to the volunteers at the History Center. We are taking in just the conversations. We're selling candy and ice cream and books, and uh, but the conversations that we're having every weekend um, are making it so worth it. So thank you to all our volunteers. If you're interested in volunteering, we have a sign-up sheet in the back. Let us know. We'd love to have you there. Um, Chris Allen is heading up the Beulah Cemetery Committee, and they met last week. Um, and then, uh, so good things are happening there. We'll report to you um, at a later date. Um, and then she's also meet, working and trying to find a win-win situation with some volunteers to work on our cemetery. So what, how, what's the word? The Community service. That's right. <laughs> Community service. <laughs> and get some young backs on that cemetery. We need some. Yeah, young. They had it before. <laughs> <laughs> They're already registered. Okay. So we kind of had some fun last last month where I was brought in, randomly grabbed some photos. And um, this is only going to take a minute, but. I think it's, it adds to um, just some of the neat tidbits and why we love Beulah history. This photo came up to me this past week because of the um, Beulah Methodist Church 150th anniversary. And what's really neat, and kind of it's kind of hard to see on this, but there's the church sitting right up there. And um, this picture was taken in 1882. It's one of the earliest photos we have of Beulah. You can see, I've got, I've got some close-ups here. There's the church again. Um, you could see the orchards. Are you sure that's not the school? Because the, they, have the, they have the steeple there to the west, and the steeple is on the east side, and it wasn't moved till 1901 because it was down below. So I'm wondering if that might not be the first school. Uh, that's a good point. Well, then we got to change it in the book we just printed. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Well, but there's a uh, there's a steeple. It looks like yeah. in the, it has got a bell tower right there. Did it have a it had it a bell tower? It looks it looks to be on that side of the school. Huh? I don't think. Yeah, steeple's on the other side of the. It's on the east side. Well, and that's it's something. On the east side of the road. It's on the west well, side of the road. Yeah. But those windows look yeah. like a church. 
Yeah, yeah that is backwards for where That's the steeple is today. Yeah. I guess it just would depend on whether you see that that's a steeple in the front, uh, right here, or yeah. if you're seeing the bell tower there. Yeah, that's there the valley the over there to the left, and so. Well, yeah, this is the original photo. Yeah. Well, there we are. So, so then you can see the orchards in the background. Um, there. And then what I, I this is kind of neat. What we're seeing right here is the Sartoris home. That was the old Herrick property. The old what? Herrick. The Herricks. So that was the Sartoris' home. You can see the pond where uh, uh, the general store is now. Yep. And there is to see the lake where um, where the, the, the Beulah General store sits. Yeah. And there's the community center? This is... Um, that became actually, the Baptist church. This is the livery center, actually. The livery stable. Then. Oh. It became the Baptist Church later. Uh, well, that was well, this is way early. This is 1882. Yeah, but it looks just like it is today. It's got that. Yeah, but that didn't rooms. happen until the 1930s. Yeah, but I'd say originally it was a community center. Yes, yes the home that's demonstration what it was club. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that burned down, and then the Baptist Church was a combination of buildings. The tools, two oh, schools. so they rebuilt like it was. They moved that building in there from somewhere. Okay, so I said I'd go by this fast. I should know with this group we can't go through anything fast. But this is the point. There's so many neat things and details when you really get to looking at some of these pictures. That um, so what this was really kind of fun, and I'm a, I, because I came across this uh, this newspaper clipping. President Roosevelt is wrong on Bessemer. And sure enough, there is a photo of um, Charles Everett, the same one who built the Alta Vista. And um, the picture was taken, um, this is what, the, in 1969, the family wrote this short story about, about the origin of this picture. Said the family checked, um, this is from Nellie, one of the daughters uh, shown in this picture. The picture was taken on grandma, Grandma's 40th birthday. Bessemer was a suburb of Pueblo as it was near the Bessemer Steelworks where your father has a barber shop. Teddy Roosevelt sent an agent out to locate a large family as he was trying to make it popular to have large families. The agent saw the photo in the window of the photographers and went to see Grandpa to get the picture and the rights to the picture to have it published, and it was published all over the country. So there's um, Charles Everett, and that's the home they lived in Beulah. It looks to me like it's got to be on Grand, um, the way it's facing. But uh, they had ten kids. And there, there he, he also built the uh, Alta Vista Hotel. And there's his business card, and also there was a millinery at, that, uh, at the Alta Vista. There's a close-up of Charles Ev Everett. Um, the uh, Alta Vista was also, so it was a dance hall, they had a, and, and they apparently had some wild times there. Um, they said there were living quarters, dance hall, a large balcony, and Blanche, who would have been the, the youngest daughter of Charles, recalls a cowboy being shot and killed on the porch, um, and, and they used a nearby chicken coop door to carry his body off. <laughs> can't make that up. There's the, there's the uh, hotel. And you can see this is at later in time they would actually make these open air rooms for the TB patients, yeah. and and they would um, separate the rooms by canvas. Right. Um, but they also called it the Hodges Hotel. There's another one, um, the great great shot of the Alta Vista, and it sit, Alta Vista sits right where Buell in parking lot um, is. Another shot of it looking west. Alta Vista on the left. Um, and then this was Blanche who told the story. She, I mean, these po you, you talk about the rabbit holes you can go down. Um, this is Blanche and her husband here. So one photo leads to another. We think he might, he might have been a marble miner as well. So um, before, and this is just to remind you, Carol Wright's party is going to be so great. Um, and then I'll get Jim set up in the back here with uh, Jim's slides here in just a second. But I <clears throat> wanted to say that um, it really, honestly, doc, the, the Reverend Doctor 
needs a little, little introduction in this room. Um, <laughs> he's been researching the Dotson cabin, are we at eight years? Well, we're almost nine. Ten. We're nine. coming up on ten. We're nine years, we're going on ten. And, and he continues to peel the onion, and we were talking about rabbit holes, and he is specifically going to talk about W.A. Rogers, the illustrator of the amazing um, uh, pictures from the cabin, which, you know, there were very little opportunity for cameras. This, this illustrator um, got a picture for us that, uh, that we are now still, well, that's what, that's what Jim's talk is all about. Um, but uh, Jim, I'm going to hand this mic over to you and get you set That's up fine. in the back. And I want to thank, thank you. One last thing about that picture of 1882. If that date is correct, I know that that it can't be. The ch church wasn't built till 1885, so there's three years that unless it's a later date or something. Remember, <laughs> 1888. It too looks like an eight. Huh? Yeah. Maybe it's an 1888 picture. You think it's an 1888? Yeah. Oh, there you are. Then it fits. It could be. <laughs> that's a clue, too. But whoever wrote be, that down. As, as we begin, uh, I want to be mindful that we have people that are joining us by this, uh, this fine uh, technology of the Facebook uh, uh, thing here. And so uh, that that includes a lot of people from a lot of different places. Not the least feeling, at least this was the, our hope, that we were going to have Joe Arrigo with us. And that hopefully Joe is there in that little, that little thing right there. And Joe right now is, is somewhere in Italy. And it's somewhere between 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. And Joe said he's going to be with us. So... There, there we are. Is it okay? It says live. It says live. Okay. Are we ready to begin then? Yes, please. All right, we are. All right. I want to call a special, special date, and I have those that are here, including one who's here a long way away, but supposedly he's still here, and that is... Though that morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, August the 17th, 2018, as we were standing in the, what well, was the former, uh, the manager's house, the foreman's house on the Dotson Ranch. We were believing that in that house somewhere there was a log cabin. And there were three of us, four, four of us all together. And we were, we were weighing the possibilities. And... It's special to me this, this, this evening that uh, Joe's online, and that Sherry is here, and we have Brother Dave is here. And we were commiserating as to what it is, where this cabin could possibly be in this, in this modern farmhouse, or ranch house. And it was finally in the midst of this that Brother Joe took a crowbar to one side of the wall, and he proceeded to remove one side of the facade of this, this modern ranch house, and going down through a couple layers, he came to these white boards and a batten in between. And it was at that moment that I began to smile. <laughs> and the reason for that, first of all, is that behind that, those, those uh, boards, there, in the crack between the boards, they were able to leverage, and that's when we saw the first evidence that there were logs behind the white boards. And that mattered. That, was, that really mattered. Because we knew that we had at least a real possibility. And with that, I want to underline what Dave mentioned, that... We didn't know if we had one room or two. We didn't know what it was that we were looking for, except, except for one thing. One thing. We did have this, and this was all we had to go by. And that which we had was a picture in Harper's Magazine of <coughs> November of 1879. Now, at that time, 
Sherry brought up two really important points. First of all, how do we know that the artist who drew this was not using creative license? It's a drawing. It's not a photograph. So yeah, we supposedly have a picture of the Dotson house, or the Dotson cabin, but who knows what it really looks like. And second, Sherry brought up a set. The second point was this. Even if there is a cabin inside this modern farm or ranch house, we have no way of knowing for sure that it's the cabin in which the Dotsons lived. It might have been some other house on the, on the property. And so it was that we then moved to another picture. Another picture of the, of the cabin. We had this. This was inside the cabin. So inside the cabin, as we pulled the, 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 uh, the walling away, if there, was, if there was a fireplace in the corner, then we should find evidence of it. And it was about a week later, I think it was Linda who said, I think it, I said, somebody said, I think Jim, you might want to go over to the cabin because they just found something. They found in the corner. Well, however this works. They found the outline the outline of the traditional adobe fireplace. Actually, they found two. They found one in the north room in the corner, one in the south room. They came together in the corner. So there you are. We had our second real possibility that we had come across the Dotson cabin. Why? Because it had shown up in one of the other pictures that was drawn by the guy who came out from Harper's Magazine. But it didn't stop there. No. When we started adding on the porch, there was a desire to say, we want the porch to look like the porch that was really there. We had to tear it down. It was, too, it was just not able to be a part of this construction. We needed a new porch. But we wanted it to look like the one. We wanted our porch to look like the one that, that the Dotsons had. And how did we know that? Well, there was a third picture. Modern. Right there. <laughs> there it is. That was the third picture. And if you'll notice that the, that the uh, whatever you call that, lattice work, mm -hmm. is the same as what we reproduced it to be. And you look at one, and you can see 150 years ago. And I'm appreciative of that. I'm really appreciative that we have a cab we have a cabin that bears such such consideration. Consideration to the one to the pictures, the few pictures that we had that were hand drawn. Um, and with that, I want to lift up all three of them. Now, these three pictures are no small consideration. I started doing the research on this, and I found out that when you make a, an illustration, you have to make an engraving that is broken up into 36 separate wood blocks. And each block has to be treated by three different artists. Each one has a different part to play in making up the final uh, engraving that is brought together by the 30, 30, 36 blocks when they come together for the printing press. So we not only had one likeness, but we had three. But more than that, we had a fourth. We had the grist mill. We had Mr. Whoever it is that draw these, we had the grist mill, the one that we call eventually the burnt mill. And it burnt down because Mr. Dotson decided that not only could he make flour in the grist mill, but he could also make whiskey. And somehow, between the fire of the whiskey and the dust of the grist mill, we ended up having 
Burt Mill and Burt Mill Road. But for all of this, what mattered is that, 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 that the, the, we have a drawing, a fourth drawing then, four drawings on the Dotson Place. And as it goes along, how important that is will become underlined. Well, I said, and I have the email where I sent this to, to Greta. I said to her, you know, this artist is so specific, I'm thinking that one could locate it by the terrain that is drawn around it. And so, Sister Greta, she picked it up. And by golly, she did. And she found the place using, wow. oh gosh, what was that? Oh, that's, that's okay, go back. Okay, she found the place that matched the drawing, and she found where it sits on the Burt Mill Road and where it sits on the St. Charles. We were able to do that because the artist was that specific. And that was significant. But it was a few days later that Sister, Sister Greta <laughs> sent me another picture. She enlarged it. She enlarged it. And over in the corner, where hardly anyone would see that was looking at the pictures, lo and behold, here was the artist drawing the picture of the grist mill and included himself in it. Now, how about that? So, I guess it was a while. It was a while before Sister Greta gave me a call. First of all, we talked about the likeness. Oh, look at this. Look how close the house that was drawn and the house that we got. Yes. And Jim, we found the gable end on the porch. It was at the other end. So it matched. The, the gable end on the porch matched exactly. That. So we yeah. actually had, we have a sample then mm -hmm. of the gable, the gables in the porch right. with, mm -hmm. with that. So we have, we all thought, okay, so we actually had a real model. But we also had the picture with it. You put the two together, and you have a sense of what it is that we made. Um, we made the likenesses that we had. But somewhere in all of it, and here it came. In the midst of all of this consideration, Sister Greta said, who is W.A. Rogers? William Allen Rogers. So what? And why does he matter to the Dotson cabin? That's all she asked. And that was the beginning of going down the rabbit hole. Who was W.A. Rogers? Well, here he is, and this is pretty much how he looked when he came to the Dawson Ranch in the summer of 1879. His dates are 1854, born in Ohio, and he died in Washington, D.C. from a heart failure in 1931, age 77. This is the man who became one more obsession. One more obsession. And he would work for several newspapers and a, and, a, and a publication called The Graphic. And he worked not only doing illustrations, but doing cartoons for the better part of 10 years. And then in 1877, then in 1877, Mr. Rogers got his big break. He became on staff one of the artists, one of the illustrators of the prime, the plum of publications. He became a part of the staff of Harper and Brothers in New York City. And it was while he was doing this that he was sent on his first mission. Actually, he did something before that. We're going to come back to that. 
But in 77 into 78, he was sent on a mission to, to Minnesota to cover an exhibition with President Rutherford B. Hayes present. It's just that when he finished there, there was a guy who said, man, if you want to draw, you need to go to North Dakota. Go to Fargo, go down the Red River, Go to the Indian settlements that are there, and then cross over, go up the river, and go to Winnipeg, Canada. Well, Mr. Rogers listened to this, and he says, that's for me. He didn't let anybody know that back at Harper's. So he took off for North Dakota, and he was gone, and he was gone. And when he showed up back in New York City, well, the people in charge of the art department were not eager to see him, <laughs> not to say the least. So it was that while he was in the art department, he said, I want to speak to the head man. But before, and they finally said, all right, I'll come down and meet with him, but eventually to give him his, his pink slip. But in the meantime, he put out on the table all kinds of illustrations that he had along the Red River among the native peoples of North Dakota and also in terms of Winnipeg, Canada. And the man came in who was in charge of it. He was not happy until all of a sudden he looked at the table. And he said, my, 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 Mr. Rogers, you made yourself proud on this one. I think we can do some, we can do some mighty fine work around what you did. All right, you're forgiven. <laughs> you're back on the payroll, Mr. Rogers. You are. And what's more, we're going to send you off. We got a we got a whole new task. We got you, and we're going to put you with one of our key key writers, a man by the name of A. A. Hayes Jr. He's one of our key writers, and we're going to send you out to Colorado, because everybody wants to know about the Rocky Mountains. 1879, the railroads coming through. Everybody wants to know about the Rocky Mountains and Colorado, and they want to know if it's for real. And I want you to go out and draw it, and I want. Mr. Hayes to write about it. And the first place you're going to go to, well, let's see, we'll check the list. Well, the first place we got you down for is you go to Pueblo, and then we're going to go out to a guy by the name of Uncle Pete Dotson's Ranch. Okay? That's what it was going to be. Yep, that's what it was going to be. And now the fun begins. Oh, friends, <laughs> now and then in the midst of doing history, you have moments that are so rich that you look at it and say, look what I just found. And that's what I share with you, this fine book, and the words of Mr. W.A. Rogers, William Allen Rogers, as he steps from the train into Pueblo, Colorado. All right? Now, you got to get the picture beforehand. This is the summer of 1879. And we have going on in Pueblo something that's called the Great Railroad Wars. Anybody ever heard about the Great Railroad Wars in Pueblo? Well, here's the thing. It seems that we have people that are fighting between the Denver Rio Grande Railroad from the north, and from the east we have people that are fighting from the Kansas Pacific, someday to be called Santa Fe Railroad, that comes from Kansas City straight through to Pueblo. And they are fighting eventually over... Who was going to get the right-of-way through the Royal Gorge? And the fight eventually became a fight among those that were the workers. And it seemed to come to a head in Pueblo. I mean, even Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday show up in all this ruckus. By golly, it's, a, it's, a, it's something. And do you know who finally won the Great Railroad War? I'll tell you. It was... The Royal Gorge Scenic Railroad. <laughs> They're the ones in the end who found the gold. And it wasn't in the hills. It was in the pockets of tourists. But that's another story. In the meantime of 1879, while they're having this big battle, it seemed that the, the workers from the Kansas Pacific, they would battle a mighty battle with the guys that were working from the Denver Rio Grande. And the next day, the guys from the Rio Grande, they would take courage, and they would beat up the guys from the Kansas Pacific. Back and forth, back and forth. That's what it was. Okay, well, here is a picture in Pueblo, 1879, 
and here is the roundhouse, and here over here is the station for the, for the Denver Rio Grande. And with that, I get to share with you now one of the great joys of this evening. <laughs> this is what happened to W.A. Rogers as he stepped from the train. I'll try to read it with as much emphasis as he tried to put in print. <clears throat> On the day when I arrived in Pueblo, Colorado, the Denver and Rio Grande faction had just been thrown out by the guys from the Kansas Pacific. We passengers were quietly eating our lunch in the station dining room when the waiters suddenly rushed to the doors, slammed them shut, and barricaded them with tables and chairs. An elderly lady opposite me, she rose in alarm. But her husband, an old mining man, told her to just sit down. <laughs> he kindly helped himself to another piece of pumpkin pie as he said to his wife, set still. I've never seen a first class fight in this town yet. Just at that moment, I heard the bark of a gun right under the window. I took, I looked out and I saw a man huddled up under close by the building with a gun in his hand. He had a bad cut across his forehead from which the blood was flowing. Across the platform, a group of men were cutting open bundles of axes, for they were about to do some mad, mighty dastardly deeds. Very soon, the posse, with the Pueblo Sheriff at its head, appeared on the scene, lined everybody up against the station wall, including the male passengers, the old miner had finished his pie by then, <laughs> and took away every weapon that they found. My revolver at that time was in my grip sack, so it escaped. The next day, now this is before he went out to, to Beulah Land, he had to do some business in Colorado Springs. The next day, I stood on the platform waiting for the train to Colorado Springs. My job my job was to make pictures. There you are. I had a little sketchbook out and was busily engaging drawing an old prospector when the train pulled in. All at once, a big, rough fellow snatched my sketchbook. <laughs> he took it out of my hand and he shouted, Here, boys! Here's that dead gun reporter that would been knocking us in those Denver newspapers. You better get him. I started after the fellow. Because I wanted my book back. But he shook me off, waving the evidence of my crime in the air. And calling to the group of perhaps 50 men at the far end of the station platform to come on, here's the guy. Now it was about that time that an old man slipped up beside me and he grabbed me by the arm and he said to me, young man, take my advice and get into that train now. <laughs> but they have my sketchbook, I said hotly. Never mind your book, boy. Those fellows are sore because yesterday they got licked really bad. And some of them right now are drunk and they are armed and they will make quick work of you if you're not careful. Now do as I tell you and get in that train and sit down in the middle of the coach and sit still. Don't say a word to no one. Well, he was dead earnest and probably knew better than I, and so much against my will, I took his advice, and pretty soon the gang appeared around the coach, peering into the coaches, but as only one of them really knew what I looked like, this old fellow that was my advisor, it seemed as though I had a good, I, I was well to follow his advice. 
The train pulled out for Colorado Springs, and I was safe. However, two days later, he was back in Pueblo. And here's where the picture, and here's where the story picks up again. He got off the train, and as he was walking along the platform, at the end of the line was the man who stole my sketchbook. <laughs> I knew I was safe because I was escorting a young woman to the, to the hotel, and that would give me free, safe passage. But then I began to realize that that was not going to deter this man. And I then began to walk, and as I came closer, the gang began to appear. On the, and as they returned, they all looked at me very hard as I passed by. And then the leader got up without a word, and he started after me. These are the times when the most timid person in the world realizes that he is up against it, that there is no more safety in flight than in facing the music. You need to face the music. And I must admit that in that moment, I felt the music was going to play just about any second. <laughs> so between me and the little hotel, I was off. I was off, but then I find that as I walked slower and then a little bit faster and faster, I began to find that I was being pursued by the man who had my sketchbook and he was after me. So it was, I walked slowly up the first row of cars, I climbed over the platforms, and in that moment, while out of the sight of my pursuer, I reached in and I transferred my 38 Bulldog Special from my hip pocket to the side pocket of my coat. And as I climbed over the couplings of the freight car, I began to realize that my follower was close behind me. He was coming down from the platform of the passenger car that was just behind me. One more row of passenger cars was ahead of me. Not a word had passed between me and the man that was at my wheels, at my heels. Suddenly, suddenly, certainly I was justified in thinking that either his time or my time had come in that lonesome spot. I remember well how I saw the whole consequences plain as the day before me. A shot would bring that whole gang in a jiffy. But what was the difference? If I was to be murdered, it was better to die in a fight than to be killed like a sheep. <laughs> and so it was that all this lightning passed through my mind as I climbed onto the platform of that last row of cars. And then my hand in my coat pocket, holding my gun cocked, I turned, and against this man, I made my stand. What is your business with me? You want to speak, and you might want to speak pretty darn quick. <laughs> Thereupon, my pursuer replied, that the superintendent of the railroad that had been wired up in Colorado Springs, and we got a message back that said that you're okay, that you're not really a reporter from the Denver newspapers, and that it was okay. So I just came here to apologize and to give you back your sketchbook. And so it was. So it was that Mr. W. A. Rogers had his introduction to Pueblo. <laughs> and with that, he then proceeded with his, with his, uh, his writer, A. A. Haynes, they proceeded on their way out to Beulah Land. Now, how do you think they went? Well, here you are, because Mr. W.A. Rogers drew a picture of it. Yeah. <laughs> they got two burrows, and they were out on the way to the Dotson Ranch. I consider this picture to be a part of the Dotson lot, because, sure, it's outside of Pueblo somewhere, but I, we all know where they're going. And I want you to take a good hard look at those men and what they're wearing. Yeah. 
And so it was that he came out, and he was at the Dodson Ranch for a while, and there's another part of the story about A.A. A. Hayes and his writing of it. That is another rabbit hole. But we're talking about the artist right now. And so it was, and this is, I think, is pretty amazing. They wrote this, their article and did their drawings the end of July, and it was published in the November issue. And in 1879, with all they had to do, that's a pretty quick turnover. And this is the outcome of it. Now, if you're looking for a copy of it, this is a copy of the 1879 magazine as it was on the stands. These, this copy, these are rare as hen's teeth. Uh, the reason for that is that magazines came and went. Yeah. There's a few of them around, but they come with a premium. But if you are interested in this, what really matters is that you can get copies of whole six months of the um, Harper's Magazine for between, between the, it sells now between uh, anywhere from 20 to $50. And that's not too bad for this, for all that you get in this, including the drawings that we've had before us. But then, but then uh, the issue is not just that these were published then, but Harper saw something here. They took the four divisions, there were supposed to be four parts. The first part was published in November of 79, that was the cattle ranches. Then there was one on the sheep herding of eastern Colorado, then one of the mining district, and then one of the tourists in Colorado. And all four of them came together in this book. You can get all four of them, you look online, you can find a copy of this book, and it has all the pictures in it. And one picture in particular I want to lift up. Because it, it, not in the issue of the one with the one of the Dawson Ranch, but in the one in mining is this wonderful, wonderful uh, drawing by W.A. Rogers of the settlement of Rosita. Oh, yeah. This is Rosita, and I don't I, I wonder if the people over there even know that there is something like this available. But you might want to look at it. It's great fun. And it also shows his artistic work. So, there we are. But we're also thankful that in this book I just mentioned to you, at the end of that book, at the end of that book, is this. Because this picture here is a picture drawn of the cattle ranches of Colorado, a, a map of New Mexico and Colorado, and it is an early map that right here has Uncle Pete's Ranch. You don't find many maps in 1880 that have that designation. I actually have found one earlier. I found one in 1871 that has Osage Avenue on it. That's neat. But uh, at any rate, uh, that book is valuable, huh? I'm sorry. Where did this, where did this drawing come from? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's in the back. It's one of the last pages of this book here, oh, okay. and it is not in any of the other publications. Mm -hmm. So, there we are. Let's see if your, your now, mic is on. what? Let me see if your mic is on. Is it on? Now it is. No. So I've been talking all this over. stuff. I'm <laughs> <laughs> in the front row. It's been great. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we are. But. There is something else that's been going on all along. Now remember, by the time this comes out, this book comes out, it's 1881. But that's not the only thing that came out in 1881. In 1881, a book came out that I'll be interested to see if any of you read it as a kid growing up. It was first in a serial of the Harper's Magazine for young people. And here it is. Toby Tyler or Ten Weeks in a Circus. Did anybody ever read the Toby Tyler books of another time? Well, in the late 1880s, on till well into this century, Toby Tyler was a really important book. In fact, Carl Sandburg said that book had more influence on him as a young person than did 
um, Huckleberry Finn or Tom Sawyer. They did a TV series on it, didn't they? They did. Yeah. And what's more... Uh, Mickey Dolan's of the Monkees. Huh? Mickey Dolan's of the Monkees. Right. Well, that's right. Well, at any rate, here is the book. And here is the movie. It was made by Walt Disney. And uh, then I guess there's a TV series as well. Yep. So Toby Tyler, even to this day, still has a hearing. But now be mindful. This is 1881 and 1882, and W.A. Rogers is now, he has now worked himself to the top of the main illustrators for Harper. Not only that, but the illustrator, the great Thomas Nast, has, re has retired. And that means that the head of illustrations for Harper's is now, uh, is now, W.A. Rogers. Anybody ever heard of Booth Tarkington? <laughs> Booth Tarkington is a writer in the 20th century that bears the designation of being one of only four, only four American authors have ever received two Pulitzer Prizes. And he's one of those four writers. And with that, with that, Booth Tarkington ran into uh, uh, W.A. Rogers, and this is what he said. You, Mr. Rogers, caused me a great deal of trouble when I was a youngster. It was a close study of your drawings reproduced in the early numbers of Life magazine that fired me to become an illustrator. I used to copy them over and over until I thought I knew the trick of what you were doing. And then I sent off a drawing to Life magazine, which in my surprise and joy, the editor accepted it, and for which I received $13. <laughs> I felt my fortune was made, and I produced 30 more drawings, all of which were rejected. <laughs> I was thus, it was thus, I was driven to my present laborious occupation as a great author, <laughs> which hasn't been the joy of yours. That was one affirmation of this. Um, it was during this time that uh, uh, Rogers not only came of his own, but he became a part of New York society. And with that, as, as the lead illustrator for, for that uh, magazine, he ended up receiving the artwork of others, including some new startup by the name of Frederick Remington. Anybody ever heard of him? Yeah, well, he submitted it, and it was W.A. Rogers who made the print off of uh, what was submitted. And it was W.A. Rogers who went to dinner with Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, a friend of his, because publishing considerations. And they had a meeting in the, in the Delmonico restaurant that was absolutely hilarious, hilarious, but we can't go into that, except to note that Mr. Rogers was on his way up. And it wasn't long that, that his political cartoons began to become more important than his illustrations. By the, 19, by the 1890s, those in charge were saying, you know this guy that writes for uh, Harper's? He can really write a political cartoon that can either make you or not make you. You need to have him as your friend. And so it was that he became a very close friend of President Grover Cleveland. And he also, with his, and he was on the train with him during the campaign of that, he also became a very close friend of Teddy Roosevelt. He was one that was in those circles because he was one who captured the political moment more and more in political cartoons. And so it was, in 1902, this is one of the characters that people face. Once you saw a, 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 more, a, a Rogers, he, had, he was able to say more in a picture than others were able to do sometimes in character. But then in 1902, we found this particular excerpt from the Art Exchange magazine. And listen, listen to what it says. In a journalistic field of our day, the cartoonist is more influential than any political writer. For there one reads the political writer, and a th uh, uh, when one reads one political writer, a thousand read the story of the cartoon 
on that, on that page. And what is more to the point, they remember a cartoon. And so it was, few among our able cartoonists have the balance, the keen penetration, and the artistic reserve of Mr. W.A. Rogers, whose work has been long familiar to the readers of Harper's Weekly and more recently in, in the New York Herald. And with that, then, he ends up in, in, in much renowned as the nation's leading uh, illustrator and political cartoonist. William Allen Rogers, the greatest of our present-day cartoonists, I want to read to you one paragraph in this. I thought it was amazing. Thomas Mann Nast, the greatest of all the native cartoonists, drove the notorious Bill Tweed and his gang of grafters behind prison bars. W.A. Rogers, an agent of righteous publicity, has driven more than one political crook into permanent exile. I don't give blankety blank about what the editors write about me. One of these men was quoted as saying, one of these crooks, but I do give a kick at being publicly held up with contempt as a beast in the pictures of that man Rogers. <laughs> By 1917, he became <coughs> really important because we were about to enter the World War. And the, and the editor, the owner of the, of the uh, New York Herald came to Rogers and said, this is on your shoulders because we need the people to see in basic terms why our men are about to go off to war. And so it was that a hundred different cartoons that ended up being published in this book by W.A. Rogers ended up being so important to the cause of the First World War that he was given Where is that thing? Here it is. He was given, this is his death in 1931, noted cartoonist, personal friend of two presidents, dies. He receives, as a, he is a, of the, he receives a great, he became a member of the French Legion of Honor for his work as a cartoonist. That is really significant. That was the influence of this man. This man who approximately 430, 40 years before, well, before I get to that, one of, today if you want to buy a painting of W.A. Rogers, there are a few out there. This one here went on action, it sold for $2,500 up here. And this down here are just prints of W.A. Rogers, but he signed them and they want $3,700 for those. That is the value that's put there. So, what does it matter to us? What does it matter to us, we of Beulah, that this man came in our midst and painted, or not painted, but drew the pictures that are a part of everything we needed to find our cabin. All of these early drawings by Harper's by William Allen Rogers, only the Dotson cabin, I want to underline this, only the Dotson cabin is a study of a single dwelling. Fourteen drawings of Colorado ranches, four would be of the Dotson ranch, and three of the Dotson cabin. Two, in the review of these early works of Rogers, art historian Robert Taft, I was going to read you this. I just, this is Robert Taft, and uh, it's a wonderful book <coughs> on American writers. And I just wanted to read this one line. From Pueblo, Hayes, and Rogers set out, first on Burl back, but later and more, thankfully, on the buckboard wagon. For a cattle ranch at the foothills of the Front Range, a ranch belonging to a one Uncle Pete Dotson. Here, Hayes acquired statistics to show the profit that could be made in the cattle business. 
for the area of the huge cattle ranches of the early 1880s was based in part on the reports that Hayes made. And Rogers had his first opportunity to sketch real cowboys and range cattle. Okay, he then goes on to make this statement. He goes on to note that the drawings of, of uh, Rogers are pretty primitive. He's after all, he's 27 years old then. Well, all except for one. Of all the drawings that show up in this book, four different issues in Harper's Magazine, of all these pictures across Colorado, there is one picture that Robert, Robert Tretaff said was very interesting. He would never say a picture was good. He wasn't going to become a critic. But he, if he liked something, he said it was good. Or he says interesting. He really liked it. He said it was very interesting. <laughs> and for all that Taft wrote, or all that uh, Rogers uh, drew, there was one picture that he said was very interesting. And that picture was the picture of old Antonio. Mm -hmm. This was a hallmark of what the great illustrator was about to become. I kind of think they did a good justice here of making t-shirts out of the best drawing that Mr. Ro Mr. Rogers came up with. <laughs> and I want to underline this right here to the people who will be involved with making the second fireplace, please, please, as much as Mr. Rogers was in detail of recreating the house, may we be just as exact in creating a likeness of this fireplace. And may somebody have the inspiration to someday make the likeness of an old Antonio. So that when people come into the Dotson house, they might see an idea of what inspired the great William Allen Rogers to paint or to draw the best work of his early career. That's significant, Eula. That really is. But there's even more. <laughs> oh, there's more in the rival. I want you to take a look at this. Hayes entertained, he and, he and Hayes, they got along really well. And he always referred to Rogers as the Commodore. And Rogers, in turn, referred to Hayes as being the Colonel. And they pictured themselves as these Eastern dandies riding through the West. And so here is the picture that is a cartoon of the both of them as they make their way to the Dawson Ranch. Okay? Now, here is the picture on the porch. It's a picture of Rosa. And up here is Pete Dotson walking at his daughter. But what you don't see, unless you're really looking for it, is that there are two men sitting to the side. One of them is Colonel Hayes, and the other one, do you see what he's doing? He is leaning forward. You can't see the pad that's in his hand, but he is in the process of drawing Rosa Dotson, and he includes himself drawing it in the picture. Why does that matter? Look at what we've got when we look close. We have a picture of Peter Dotson, the world-renowned William Allen Rogers, and Rosa Dotson. What a phenomenal, phenomenal picture this is. Not just of the Dotsons, but of the man that's drawing it. I dare suggest you won't look at these three pictures the same anymore.
These are really important. There is Uncle, there's Uncle Pete in one of the early other drawings that he draws in the house. If you look at it really close, there's Uncle Pete by his chair. And here's what we've got. We have the cabin that William Allen Rogers made three drawings of for Harper's Magazine. That matters. I laid tribute to this saying, Beulah, don't treat this passively. See what we've got and let's make the most of it. And one of the things that I've found to do is I've been collecting some of his artwork. And my hope is that someday we can have an exhibit of the man who drew the pictures of our, of our uh, place. We've got so many possibilities that we can go with this. And so I lift that up to you in the hopes that you will <laughs> join with me in thinking of all the different ways we can honor not just this cabin as a matter of local interest, but that as a cabin that in its certain moments touched the pulse of the country as a whole, including in the life of the man and even the paper he drew on of William Allen Rogers. May that be a spirit of us to continue on because we have more rabbit holes and Sherry's about ready to go on Tuesday and go down to try to find one more rabbit hole from these other two books I have here, but that's another story. It just keeps on going. And that's what makes this so exciting. The story doesn't end, and when you have an endless story, you have a reason to sit on the porch and imagine all of that was there and all that you might be able to be, if you put your mind to it, to write your own story of life on this land. Thanks. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that one picture, the porch that showed the lattice. Above it looked like there was more lattice up there. Yeah, there was, oh yeah, there was. There was lattice up above, and I guess if you wanted to, you could probably lattice off that whole area. I'm glad that what we have is a sense of that lattice across that, but it is also opened up to allow us to have the view of the wonderful view, not only of the valley, but of Beulah Hill that was opened up by Peter Dotson in 1865. That's a good point that you mentioned. But there was. There was. Lattice. There was lattice up above, and she had flowers right. that filled it in, and that would have made a much cooler place in the summer. That would have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. So an editor from Harper's. Assigned, I'm sorry. So an editor from Harper's assigned Rogers to come out. Yeah. And specifically, was assigned to send him to. The Dotson Ranch. It was the first. It, it was supposed to go on. It's called. It's called the Cattle Ranches of Colorado. So the first one was the Dotson Ranch, and then he went further south. But from the further south on, he would give one picture here, and another picture of somewhere else. The only place that he ever focused on anything was at the Dotson Ranch. Why had the Dotson Ranch come to the attention of an editor in New York? I'm sorry. Why had the Dotson Ranch come to the attention of the editor in New York? I, I still didn't Yeah, know. why did the Dotson Ranch even come to the attention of an editor? Oh, by York? the time of 1879, the Dotson Ranch was a place of excursion. Uh, people, as early as 1872, when the, when the trains first arrived, Pueblo was an important destination. Because in Pueblo, you could get the train north, you could get the train, or you could get the... Yeah, the train was still going, was going on to Canyon City, at least at some point when it came close to Florence anyway. And then you could go to the Royal Gorge. Or by shortly 73, 74, you could go south all the way up over the pass and down into out in the San Luis Valley. So Pueblo was important. And for those who chose not to go to all these other railroad destinations, but to experience Pueblo or the area, the Dotson Ranch was, was a hallmark ranch 
as a place you would want to go to see a community of workers. Because at that time, the Dodson Ranch had between 100 and 150 workers with 19 houses that were around the main house. Dodson was not a little, it was not just a ranch house, it was a community. It had a, a store, it had a school, it had um, a lumber business that was, well it was in Beulah, but they also came on over there. The cattle industry itself, they also ran a copper mine. So there was so much activity going on on the Dodson Ranch with as many workers as it had, it just had a lot of energy. And you went out of there to see all the culture coming together between the Mexican workers and the people that were, uh, and the, and the, uh, the non-Mexican population that was there. Yeah. How long did the Dodson family hold the ranch? They owned it. They moved in in 1865. They sold the most of it in 1880. Uh, and it, and then, so that's something else. They didn't sell it locally. They sold it to the Colorado Development Corporation that was owned by uh, uh, Barclays Bank and the London Investment, uh, investment Fund family, uh, investment company. And that's a whole other story. But at any rate, <coughs> they, had a, they had, were on the ranch when the, from the how, time the house was built in 1872. They were there until 1880, and they were allowed to stay there until 1887. They would come out back and forth, but they were in the process of moving to Pueblo at that time. Yeah. So, okay. so, I'm sorry, did I, fit, did I answer all the questions that you had in terms of, of what you were saying? Why did they come to the Dotson Ranch? Mm -hmm. In Pueblo, every time Peter Dotson came to Pueblo, the newspaper said, Uncle Pete's back in town. And uh, <coughs> it was... It was a place in Pueblo that you wanted to get away to because you could go there for a day, stay there, and then come back the next day. So it was a place for Pueblo to get away for. And so when the people showed up in Pueblo, it was a, it was a known, known quantity. And when the people in Harper start writing, this became one of the key ranches that, that, that you would want to see in southern Colorado. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> Thank you, Jim. Good job, Jim. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have one more. I have one, one, one last thing. It's my pride and joy. I got to show. I got to show this. This is my pride and joy. I was in the midst of looking for these prints, and I found out that W. A. Rogers had written his autobiography, and I knew that I would never be able to afford. Uh, a, an original sketch or drawing that's way out of line. But I happened to notice that on the eight books that there was not only an autograph copy, yeah, oh, wow. but he had drawn he had drawn a sketch. Now you don't understand the sketch until you read the book and realize that it was W. A. Rogers who was the first person publicly in the in the media that said, people, get off the backs of the Salvation Army. Stop making fun of them. He went down in the streets and he watched what they were doing. He saw what was happening. And yeah, they were off key and they stood in the gutter and maybe they, maybe they looked out of whatever, but he said, these people, these people deserve respect for what they're doing. And this picture here is the man who's the head of the Salvation Army in the 1920s. So this is a hand-drawn page from Mr. W. A. Rogers. Jim just has a way of bringing a topic to life, doesn't he? Yes. Thank you, Jim. Um, we. We've got one more lecture uh, left for the season, and Ken Balawag is going to be presenting that next month, October, the third Thursday of the month. And um, Ken has been, is, is, it's, it's really like chapter two, or maybe this chapter 99, I don't know. But I know that he's been putting a lot of muscle and back into excavation and has found some incredible things over the last year since he last spoke 
Has it been two years? It has been two years. Mm -hmm. So Ken's going to come back and, and, and give, give us a follow-up because of uh, just so much that both he and I have learned in the last uh, two years. So join us for that. And um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Help yourself to, uh, to some cookies and, and, uh, and come see us at the History Center. We're open Saturday and Sunday, 10 to 2. And um, it's just a neat place to hang out. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for joining us.